All right, we're recording. Um, and I'll share my screen. So, um, I don't know how you want to do this. I'll edit this first bit out until we work out what I'm doing. Yeah. I think, uh, so, so the goal of this is to get an embedded video where we talk about mm. uh, the future of create um, and put it on, I think this page actually. Yeah. Um, so, so that would be the goal. Uh, yeah. I think it can, it can be just like a, a quick walkthrough of this page. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go into your category visions? Probably makes sense to, to at least a little bit. Yeah, but I don't know probably. if you can cover this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten. There's ten of them. Yeah, I mean, I th I think I can probably cover them um, in some some detail. Yeah, just like what we've been working on and where we're headed next, because I think that's sort of like the purpose of this. Just a quick overview. Okay, so let's just, let's start here. Let's spend just a few minutes on this page, and then just walk one by one through through the categories. And um, I think as long as you basically kind of describe just real quickly, you know, what it is and then what the big things are and that we've, we've kind of got planned already, yeah. um, then, then we're probably good. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So you can edit at this point. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know how do I even start this. <laughs> okay, edit at this point. Yeah. So uh, this is a quick conversation between myself and Eric on the product vision for the create stage of the DevOps lifecycle at GitLab. Um, I guess firstly, the create stage of the DevOps lifecycle um, covers code creation, um, code review, uh, but also some other important areas of that process uh, around wikis, snippets, the web IDE that makes it easy to uh, propose edits and changes, uh, code search with elastic search, um, and also new categories coming soon like design management and live coding. So um, it's very focused on the, the Git aspects and the source code aspects, but there's uh, important supporting roles uh, in facilitating that code creation workflow. And that's really what the create stage of the DevOps lifecycle is all about. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll just talk quickly through this page, but feel free to break in with questions um, to clarify things. Um, I guess the create stage of GitLab has been around quite a long time. So there's quite a lot of maturity, particularly in the source code management and code review categories. Um, I guess that leads into an explanation of categories. Um, so at GitLab, we break the stage of the DevOps lifecycle down into different categories. Um, and I'll quickly talk through those different categories before jumping into, I guess, like the key items that we've been working on in each. Um, so the first category is source code management, which is really the permissions, controls, policies um, around the Git repositories itself. Um, so that, that includes the repositories interface, the branches, um, protected branches, um, all those kind of controls, um, forking, um, so yeah, that's, I guess, like the heart of it. And then on top of that is the code review category and that builds and works very closely with the source code management category, uh, which is really where the code review process happens, lots of discussion and a lot of time is spent in this part of the application by software engineers and developers. Um, it's really the tool that defends against code quality um, and uh, is a source, is the place where mentorship happens for junior engineers um, and important hard decisions are made once people get into the trenches of building code. Um, so doing code review well is very important for team efficiency, um, the workflows and handoffs between the different stakeholders involved in the code review because there's the author and there's typically multiple reviewers, um, also the controls around approval. Um, so there's the, the efficiency aspects and the code quality aspects um, of code review. Um, both the source code management and code review categories um, are mature, as I mentioned, source code management being the first feature ever built in GitLab um, back in 2011. And then code review was, uh, or merge requests were first launched in GitLab 2.0, which I think was around December 20, 2011. Um, so they've been viable for quite a long time and are quite mature now. Um, 
to the point of lovability. However, there's still, I guess, important areas of improvement that we want to get to, um, to make specific aspects of those um, categories lovable. Um, because although they might be lovable at the aggregate, there are specific workflows that are, are not yet lovable and we have more work to do. Yeah, so that, I think it's interesting to, to continue iterating on, on a lovable category. We should probably put a little bit of thought into once a category mm -hmm. does get to lovable, indicate that that's not when development stops. That's not when we stop improving on it. Um, we want to continue just to remain relevant. Um, we don't want to let competition catch up. And, and uh, you know, obviously, we, there's a lot more things in Polish that we can add to both of those categories. Yeah, and I think lovability is kind of a relative term. Like, are we benchmarking ourselves against uh, source code management tools or all-in-one package tools, or are we comparing ourselves to um, best-in-class point solutions for code review? Um, thinking about those kinds of comparisons and also the, the different expectations different kinds of users have. We might be lovable for a significant majority of users, but um, there are other classes of users like scientific research organizations that have slightly different workflows and even large enterprises that are migrating from non Git source code management tools to Git um, will have different expectations and workflows given the structure and shape of their applications um, and source code assets we think of them as like quite disposable, but a lot of companies develop these code bases that they build on for decades. Um, and it's very hard to change and re-architect um, a big application to match modern best practice. So we have to consider different kinds of workflows and have flexible primitives. The next category is design management, which we are about to launch. Um, so design management um, is an exciting new category in 2019 uh, for the create stage of the DevOps lifecycle. Um, and it's really about providing a place for designers to live inside of GitLab, not, not replace all their workflows and all their tools, but designers already in GitLab collaborating with engineers, collaborating with product managers on issues, on merge requests, making sure what's built matches the designs. Um, and there's a lot of discussion that happens before anything gets built with regards to designs. And we've observed particularly at GitLab, but also customers as well that the only real way to do that is either by linking to some external tool like Envision and having mock-ups there and doing the design collaboration in a different tool or the images and mock-ups are uploaded into GitLab in the form of images in comments. Um, so people are hurriedly typing out markdown tables to fit all the images in nice little tile grids manually, but then there's no easy way to actually leave comments and have a discussion and track revisions. Um, and we think that we can do better than that. Uh, we want something better than that at GitLab ourselves um, and using Git as the back end for storing those designs, um, building on the capabilities around image discussions we have in merge requests and bringing those into non-code changes uh, into the planning life cycle um, and that I guess like iterative delivery process um, is going to be really exciting. Yeah, I think it's neat because it, it treats designers as first class citizens inside the application. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if, if you look at all of the various personas that we could actually serve throughout the entire product in the DevOps lifecycle, um, obviously developers are, are treated as first class citizens, but there's probably very other, very few other personas we could hang our hat on right now and say that you, you are a first class citizen that we've solved a bunch of problems for you on. And, yeah. uh, you know, even, even PMs, I wouldn't say necessarily, um, are, are treated that way yet. So uh, I'm really excited to see this one. It's, it's something I'm really looking forward to. And, uh, I'm, I'm excited to obviously get a bunch of feedback on it too. Yeah. Um, I'll, I can show specific mockups when we dive into that. Um, the other categories, uh, wikis. Um, so <laughs> wikis, are, I think, well, probably well understood by people who've used GitHub. Um, they're a first class feature of GitHub and they've been a first class feature of GitLab for quite a long time. Um, we think they're pretty complete um, in their capabilities, um, but they're also something where there's more potential um, than where we've taken them and where other products have taken them. Um, particularly around uh, like there's small features like better table of contents generation, um, like small quality of life improvements, but then there's also the potential in the future to really uh, reconsider the purpose of the wiki um, and which kind of stakeholders should be involved in it. So it's backed by a Git repository, but the interface is very Spartan and 
a little bit obtuse. So it's mostly used by technical people for documentation um, of the things that they're building. But there's tremendous opportunity to turn it into a much more useful knowledge-based tool for product managers and um, large parts of organizations where uh, collaboration happens that is of a different nature to issues and planning um, and execution. Um, and for different, different kinds of stakeholders, there's probably different needs rather than having a plain text markdown input interface, having a rich text WYSIWYG editor, um, live collaboration, kind of like a Google Doc, um, deeper cross-linking throughout GitLab. Those kind of capabilities uh, would be necessary to really take this from being a simple wiki to something that's a much more powerful knowledge base uh, for a project um, for all kinds of people and roles. Um, the web idea was an exciting category that was introduced in 2018, last year, um, and we've been iterating on it steadily, um, release after release. Um, it's one of those features that at first seemed maybe unusual uh, to introduce, but we've found it incredibly useful at GitLab um, for incidental edits, uh, small things that we find that are wrong in code, fixing bugs, um, and that's really what we aim for initially. But more and more, it's becoming a tool where uh, people can come to make increasingly complicated edits, uh, add documentation, um, update websites, uh, all sorts of things where you maybe don't need to be running heavy unit tests and live previews to be confident in your change. Um, and we've been working on this year um, and late last year in improving those capabilities so that you could actually test and verify your work before you commit it. Um, and uh, we're hoping to get to a uh, complete level of maturity quite soon um, where we have the ability to test and preview changes before committing them. Snippets is the is another area of create. Um, they're a way of sharing code with uh, colleagues and friends. Um, you can create them in your personal namespace. You can create them inside of a project. They're quite basic. They don't have versioning. They don't have multiple file support. Um, and there's there's really big opportunity for us to make snippets more like what people expect. Them. Most people expect snippets to be um, a little bit more similar to lightweight Git repositories. Um, which would be similar to how um, GitHub has implemented gists, and I think some of our other competitors might have approached this problem. Um, our snippets are more akin to, I guess, a local snippet manager you might have in your IDE. Um, and so I think there's, there's an exciting opportunity for us to uh, choose maybe a more interesting direction for them and deeply integrating them into GitLab in all sorts of interesting ways. Um, finally, well, not finally, <laughs> next up we have, <laughs> there's so many categories. Uh, next up we have search, which is a very important category where a lot of work is happening at the moment, um, specifically with regards to Elasticsearch and enabling support on gitlab.com. Elasticsearch is a really great feature, um, that's available for self-hosted customers. Um, but it's not enabled on gitlab.com currently. We're beginning to enable it for some groups, um, and incrementally beginning to roll it out but there's a lot of challenge associated with rolling out Elasticsearch for such enormous amounts of data. Um, GitLab.com has over 300 terabytes of repositories that would need to be indexed for source code search, not to mention terabytes of data in the database as well, which would also need to be indexed for search. Um, so there's significant challenges in scaling Elasticsearch to that level, um, as well as the actual process of indexing all that data um, to make it available for Elasticsearch. Um, so we're starting small and incrementally working through those challenges um, and how we'll bring that to all our customers on gitlab.com and make it easier for our large on-premises customers to deploy it because they're also facing struggles um, using it. Yeah, and just one comment on, on search, which used to live in the plan stage of the DevOps mm -hmm. lifecycle and was recently moved to create as the primary use case for search um, at least for most of our users and, and for most of uh, the GitLab team members is, is really for code search. Um, but of course, there's also other very important elements for searching inside the application, mm -hmm. you know, such as through issues and epics and, and so on and so forth that will get improved once this, you know, kind of comes to fruition. Yeah, particularly being able to search across multiple groups and projects and globally dive into things. Um, that's really important for uh, 
working effectively uh, in a big organization in your own private instance. And it's also very valuable um, for GitLab.com where we hope to have more and more open source projects. We've already got a lot, um, but being able to search and see how other people are using libraries, um, looking for common problems. Um, it's a very key source of knowledge. Um, so really important that we get that right. Live coding is something that we're looking at for later in the year. It's a category that we've planned for 2019, uh, FY20. Um, should probably be using financial years, um, but we're planning for later this year um, to make it possible to do pair programming the web IDE. Um, could be really interesting for shared note taking as well. So we're looking at different use cases that might not be uh, deep pair programming. Um, so it's, it's quite interesting. And there's also opportunities for hopefully building a shared um, foundation where we can use uh, like that live collaboration feature, maybe in wikis and issues um, for working together uh, more effectively in a synchronous fashion. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to build something really useful. Um, and then Gitter is a, an open source instant messaging tool that we bought a few years ago um, and we've been working on uh, I guess fixing some important issues uh, there's been feedback particularly around threaded messaging emoji reaction um, there's an active community that does use Gitter and enjoys it quite a lot it's important that we continue to maintain support there and retain those customers and we're also working to improve the native integration between Gitter and GitLab um, particularly by making it easy to create a Gitter channel for your project um, out of the box on GitLab and then um, inside of Gitter, adding deeper integration for un unfurling links to projects and issues and things like that. And then finally, Gitterly, which is really very closely linked to all the, the Git parts of source code management and code review. Uh, Gitterly is how we scale Git. Um, and it's also the team that uh, is really in the weeds on shaping Git itself as well. So um, we've got uh, work planned on supporting larger and larger repositories, um, really pushing the limits of what Git's capable of. Um, and that includes for enormous monolithic repositories and also projects that are large because of the binary objects um, they include. Um, so the Git Elite team is really important in making sure Git is stable, fast and reliable um, and providing a stable foundation for people to migrate from tools like Perforce, say, to GitLab. And they typically have enormous depots because the structure of Perforce is quite different. It makes it easy to accumulate an enormous single repository. Um, so we need to have the foundation to support those customers migrating. So that's a not a super quick, but a, a reasonable overview of all the categories of Create. Yeah, um, I think that that's very helpful, I think, to probably a lot of people that will be watching this. I think it would be really helpful to dive into, um, <clears throat> you know, if possible, hmm. a vision that that may not necessarily be um, defined in terms of what the next, you know, tactical steps are, but but at least from a, a year or two out, what each of these uh, we desire for them to be, uh, which you've, you've gone into a little bit, but then also yeah. like d diving down into what are we doing what's the next thing we're doing in each one of these categories to, to get going. So I think that would be, that would be helpful. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll start from the top and work our way down. So um, source code management, um, really a lot of our vision is related to um, long-term looking at larger and larger repositories. And this is tightly coupled with the, the Giddily roadmap, uh, making sure monolithic repositories work well in the order of a hundred gigabytes or larger um, eliminating the need for LFS. Um, those are some really big goals. Um, particularly looking at some of the, the key customer success issues related to that. Um, once you start having these larger and larger projects that get split across um, multiple projects, say multiple repositories, then there's coordination problems because although they might be split into different repositories, they're generally not well decoupled. Um, and so we're looking at that for later this year, but there's a, I think there's a long roadmap ahead of the first iteration in really supporting these large organizations that have probably partially migrated to Git, but are still in the process of migrating their most complex and difficult projects. Uh, be they hardware manufacturers, uh, silicon designers, or just long-term veterans of the software industry that have enormous complex products that are critical, um, being able to support those. 
Um, I guess in the shorter term, there's some important work that we need to do in terms of forking workflows, uh, confidential merge requests for resolving security issues. Um, I think those are pretty exciting improvements. We're making a start on resolving confidential issues using private forks in the next release, 12.1, or with the next release we're about to start developing. 12.0 is probably the next release that uh, our viewers will see a release post about. Um, and then forking improvements. There's some significant gaps between the capabilities of using a native branching model inside a shared project versus using a forking workflow. And we need to close those gaps, resolve some permissions um, related issues. And that'll dovetail nicely with our work on uh, using private forks to resolve confidential issues. Um, and we've got uh, work that is about to be released in 12.0 um, for deduplicated forks, and that's going to enable fast forking. Um, so teams that use the far, use forking will be able to fork projects instantly, um, and system administrators won't have to worry about huge amounts of disk space being gobbled up by duplicated data. Um, so that's sort of short term and long term where we're going on the source code management front. Yeah, I'm really excited for the the kind of deduplication of, of forking objects. That's a it's a very common workflow in a lot of organizations. And so those working improvements should help drive adoption of in some of the Git bits of GitLab. Yeah. On code review, um, we've been doing a lot of research recently into the challenges and workflow problems associated with complicated code review. The fact that code review isn't always simple and clean, multiple cycles, multiple reviewers, multiple approvers, managing that process and making it efficient and effective. Um, we recently released multiple assignees um, and we have improvements coming to um, improve, uh, I guess, the way unresolved comments can be navigated. Um, but most importantly, one of the things we're looking at improving is efficiency by making the merge request diffs more accurate. Um, and calculating good merge request diffs is quite challenging um, because Git natively calculates diffs by looking at the merge base, which can often be quite a few days or weeks old, depending on how long lived the feature branch is. And so the contents of the diff may not reflect what realistically is actually merged. And so we're working on improving the accuracy of those diffs. Um, to improve the efficiency of that review process. And we're also looking at improving the efficiency of the review process through improved performance. Um, so file by file merge request diffs um, is one of the areas we're looking at um, quite seriously at the moment. Um, trying to reduce the amount of data we load onto the page, trying to um, increase the focus on the task at hand. Uh, there's a lot of data presented everywhere all over the merge request page. Um, and so trimming that down, making it focused, making it fast, making it easy to navigate is critical for making the code review process efficient. And that, I guess, like speaks to longer term vision, which is really improving the, the way the merge request interface handles very large merge requests. Uh, we see it on even moderately large merge requests every month at GitLab working on the release post that there are challenges when you get more than a few hundred lines changed in a single file or you get 50 commits in a single branch it just becomes hard to move around, hard to work out what's happening. Um, so improving support to support more than a thousand files, improving support to um, handle very large diffs, making rendering fast um, and also improving uh, the ability to understand what's changed since you've last viewed the merge request. So, um, we'd like to be able to track unread diffs, files, and discussions so that when you come into a merge request, you only have to review what's new. Um, and that, that was one of the key pieces of feedback that came out of uh, the research into making code review easier and more efficient. Um, unsurprisingly, there's also policy requests and um, access control related to merge requests. That's a significant um, thing that we're considering. Um, we did a lot of work over the last six months in improving the capabilities of uh, the approval process with uh, more flexible and um, capable controls with multiple merge request approval rules and code owners. Um, but there's, uh, there's always going to be a long roadmap ahead to make sure we're supporting the right balance of uh, restrictiveness and permissiveness to um, allow teams to be effective. So 
Um, and I guess related to some of these efficiencies for merge requests, we're also um, exploring um, and sort of crafting a vision into the future to look at, I guess, more open-ended reviews where not only are you limited to the commits that are actually in the feature branch, but considering unchanged files, considering um, commits that have already merged, um, good code review doesn't mean just focusing on the diff at hand. Um, and so we want to make it much more open-ended, um, really support deep, thoughtful code reviews because it's much better to <laughs> catch problems before they enter the code base than after a, a big problem has been deployed into a production environment. So I think just really focusing in on these detail and efficiency related uh, challenges on code reviews revision. Yeah, I think, I think code review is really interesting based on what you just mentioned, this review of a regular review of code for things that might not necessarily have a diff. Uh, mm. And then like the interplay between code analytics, which lives in the managed stage of the DevOps life cycle and our, our users getting alerts or getting notifications or at least having the data at their fingertips to understand where in the code base um, do I potentially have a problem, not in terms of the functionality of the code, but in terms of when that code was last touched or is there still mm -hmm. anyone in my organization that even understand how that piece of code works? Yeah. Um, and so dovetailing that data into a code review process that might not necessarily have a diff or someone might not even be working on, I think is, is one of those vision items that I'm really excited to bring to life within the, uh, within the application. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's, there's also, I guess, once we work through these uh, more basic foundational um, like elements of really uh, making it deeply lovable um, there's, there's more work. I think there's an opportunity for us to really accelerate best practices um, particularly around uh, the Git commits being um, valuable. I think uh, the value of, high quality commits, high quality commit messages and creating a useful Git history is um, often undervalued, um, partly because it's not the easiest thing to achieve. Um, tools could be improved significantly to um, make achieving like always every single commit in a merge request be green and um, every single commit message have value and meaning. So when you're digging through the code base, um, using local tooling or in some other tool outside of GitLab that you can make sense of what you're looking at. Um, and code often ends up in other places. Like even if the GitLab is the source of truth, like your code might end up mirrored into some other project, which is hosted somewhere else um, and relying on links to merge requests that are potentially confidential or hidden away somewhere else um, can mean that people are at a real loss to understand the purpose of certain changes. Um, so having that best practice thinking um, is really, really important. Um, so I did mention I'd show you some screenshots of design management. Um, we're still focused on the first iteration of design management. So it's probably a little early to speak about where we're going to take this uh, once we get this out the door and iterate, because we know there's going to be a lot of feedback. It's going to be, um, I don't know, quite a few iterations till we make this, uh, this first MVC really great. Um, but the starting point is pretty tremendous. Uh, we're aiming for version designs with point of interest discussions backed by a Git repository. So that's a pretty good starting point. Um, if I can find the designs here, The idea being you'll be able to, in an issue, something like this, there'll be a new tab down here called designs. And in there, you'll be able to upload a variety of screenshots, upload new versions of them, keep track of them and discuss them. And the way you'll discuss them is with point of interest comments. So you'll actually be able to leave comments on specific issues uh, on the thing. So maybe the, the title is the wrong text size or you think the copy is not representative of the copy that's going to be there, or you want to provide some sort of other meta feedback. It can, um, it's a lot more flexible than just having a grid of 10 images and having to be like on the third image in this little part here, 
this thing is wrong or have you considered X? Um, being able to click on something and leave direct feedback is tremendously valuable. Um, having previously used Envision, um, it was by far and away one of the best features <laughs> of all the features they had. That was the one the whole team embraced. Um, so looking beyond this first iteration, the polish around this, this workflow, I think opening up Git access, providing more automation. So designers can work locally on their different design files and simply push. And then all of a sudden the mock-ups get updated. Um, those kind of workflows, um, are, yeah, they're not that far away because we've chosen to use a Git repository upfront. Um, there's all sorts of opportunities for using pre-commit hooks to do interesting things. Um, there's a possibility of using CI in the future on the Git repository, even, um, uh, CI for design to automatically maybe validate usability guidelines, looking for contrast problems. There's all sorts of opportunities um, to take this really far um, just in this specific area without even getting to design reviews and design systems and trying to capture them. So there's um, lots of potential, but we'll need to listen to customers and hear where they want to go uh, after we get this first iteration working well. Um, on the wikis front, um, in the short term, the vision is really just to improve some of the basics. Uh, we've done some really wonderful jobs making issues easy to edit and there's a consistent editing interface throughout GitLab for all sorts of things. But the wikis have kind of missed out and fallen behind and are a little inconsistent and hard to use. So I think it would make a big difference for a lot of regular users just to make it a little bit more consistent, a little bit more polished. Um, and similarly, navigation is like, the biggest problem most customers face with wikis. As the wiki grows, generating <laughs> navigational uh, anchors automatically so they don't have to do that manually um, will go a long way. Um, looking longer, as I mentioned, uh, thinking about Confluence, Google Docs, Notion, a whole range of tools that are build up knowledge bases in different ways. I think there's a lot of research we need to do into uh, understanding how we would even approach solving those problems, um, they're huge industries and markets of their own um, that are different in important ways from the wikis we have today. So um, there's a lot of work to be done to unpick that and work out if that's the right direction, but it's something we're exploring. James, I'm curious to your thoughts on replacing our handbook with a GitLab wiki. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I think it's, it's challenging the restrictive format of wikis in some respects, like having a fully rendered website provides a lot of flexibility for custom content and generation and scripts. Um, it'd be interesting to consider what it would take to do that. Um, I mean, the, the obvious advantage is that the connection between editing and seeing it is instantaneous. You don't have to edit some source code and then wait for it to be deployed. Um, I think the challenge is link validation, making sure that things don't break, thinking about review process. Um, there's an interesting proposal from a little while back that I think Sid actually opened a few years ago to potentially make wikis a subdirectory of the main repository. And so then you get merge requests for free. So if you want a wiki, you just have a slash wiki directory. That's quite interesting. Um, there's a lot of implications in terms of having non-technical users potentially polluting your commit history of your <laughs> primary repository, which is a little concerning um, as someone who's very big on commit hygiene, <laughs> that freaks me out. But um, the idea of having all the power of CI merge requests ready to roll is, is pretty great. Um, and you could even use code owners to enforce like particular approvals on specific things. Like most of the wiki doesn't need any approval to merge, but maybe specific areas do um, rather than rebuilding all those features into a wiki, maybe just make the wiki a repo. Um, there's other ways of maybe taking that approach without making it a subdirectory, but that's an interesting approach. I think. The other thing that is striking to me on, on this page is the competitive landscape section. So, uh, you know, the, the confluence, I think that makes sense. If I think if you were to go survey a hundred people off the street and say, mm -hmm. you know, what's the leading wiki product, you'd say it was confluence. Um, 
And so it's interesting that that's under the we should be competing with because I think I think that is like the quintessential wiki product. But things like Notion and, and Google Docs, you could almost make an argument that wikis might not be those things. Maybe issue descriptions yeah. become Google Docs. Maybe snippets becomes like our, our competition to Google Docs. Or, or even like the web IDE opening a, a blank file that uh, you can choose what to do with after you're done with it. Um, similar to how you can name a Google Doc after the fact. Like it, the barrier of entry is so low, you just start typing and then before you have to save it, you have to, you have to give it a name. Um, that would be an interesting approach uh, as well. And uh, I know that I, when I, I tweeted out last week, um, or someone tweeted at, at GitLab and said how much they love the web IDE and I retweeted it and, and asked them like, well, what would love to know what else we could do to make it, make you love it more. And of course, like dark mode came up. And <laughs> we should just talk about dark mode, but, um, but then our old um, VP of product, um, uh, Yob, uh, commented and said, well, I, I'd love the ability to uh, kind of create a blank file. I'm not sure what exactly I'm, I'm going to do with yet. And, I'm not certain if the web ID is the right place for that or if wiki is the right place or if snippets. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, but it's interesting to think about. We've, we've got a number of small primitives where I think that makes sense, um, but finding the right kind of user flow and user journey through that process, uh, I'm not sure if we've nailed it yet. Yeah, Maybe. and the, the wiki prim primitive is kind of interesting in that we have GitLab pages and we have the ability to deploy static sites really easily. So the difference between wikis and those kind of things is really like technically it's, they're quite similar under the hood. They're, they're a repository and there's some script that generates the page on demand. Um, well, I guess in the case of pages, it generates all the static pages, whereas wikis, it just sort of generates them as needed. And that means you can just edit it in real time. Um, and there's some convenience methods for like, I guess, an opinionated way of using it. Um, so I do wonder if, if wikis is even needs to be its own primitive or whether the problems that it solves are better rolled into something else. And we provide like a really good pattern for using projects to achieve what confluence does or something like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, more, to, it, more to investigate there. Yeah. And it's a really important tool for a lot of customers, the wikis that we have today. So it's, um, although I don't think we extensively use it internally at GitLab, I know the Gitter team makes pretty heavy use of it, but um, there are the companies that do use it rely on it a lot um, in their daily jobs. And it's, it's such a wonderful side effect that you get this version controlled history in plain text that is completely portable and transferable. Um, I think the knowledge base is a, is a really interesting and strong use case for something like a wiki because it mm -hmm. you know my back to my first question i'm like could the handbook be made mm -hmm. into a wiki well what is the handbook it's basically a, a knowledge base uh, not in q a format but in terms of how yeah. we work and our history and whatnot um and that seems like a good use case for something like a wiki where you you might not want it to change as easily as a google doc but you uh you want it to change faster than say um you know, an actual code repository. Yeah. It's an interesting thought. I wonder if we should just make forking faster and easier because if you put in a wiki, it's very like, it's not inclusive of people who are outside of the project because the wiki is then limited to the people who are part of the project. There's no way for them to open a merge request and propose things. And we have community members and other people who open merge requests to fix typos or um, ask questions because we want that to be possible. And I imagine for open source projects, you don't want to have the maintainers be the pure like authors of this FAQ. It'd be great for other people to be able to contribute content. Um, interesting challenges. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. We, we should probably move on. We only have a few uh, right. like minutes left. Yes. On the web ID. So, um, Web ID has evolved a lot since we launched it. Um, we added uh, client side evaluation so you can preview uh, JavaScript projects in the Web IDE and edit them in real time. That's powered by Code Sandbox. Um, we collaborated a lot with Ive to make that happen, um, the founder of Code Sandbox. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And we've also been working on server side evaluation. That's been quite a challenging project um, involving quite a few components and it's where more work will need to come over the following releases once we release the 
even the first iteration, it's going to be um, pretty limited, pretty basic. Um, but essentially the, the short term vision is really making it possible to um, got to find the screenshot uh, live preview, making it possible to open a project in the web IDE, make an edit, run the tests, see a live preview and then commit it. So this is a screenshot of uh, client side evaluation, but server side evaluation will look pretty much exactly the same. You'll have your code that you're editing. You'll have a live preview and there'll be a web terminal as well. Um, which is not shown in this screenshot. And in the web terminal, you'll have uh, your server running, whether that's a, a Rails development server or a JavaScript server with Webpack or something like that. Um, you'll have that running and then you'll have the preview. You could run tests and run NPM test or RSpec and actually test everything's working, test it in the browser before you commit. So essentially replicating the local development environment experience. Um, it's pretty rare for engineers to build features and never run some kind of test locally before they commit them. I mean, maybe they do and just wait for CI to fail, but it's nice to be able to test things manually before you commit them. Um, yeah. Well, it can take up to 10 or 15 or 20 minutes sometimes for a pipeline to fail. So it's exactly. a saver. Yeah. And not having to wait for a whole review app to spin up like GitLab, is great because we have review apps and so you push something and if it's configured you can see a real working version of your application um, but being able to see it and edit things live and see them change in the browser in real time that's huge i mean a lot of developers spend a lot of time getting all the tooling set up locally so they've got the browser taking half the window and then as they type, they literally see the react or vue.js components changing in real time in the browser or they change some server side code, it recompiles and then the page reloads and you can actually see changes happening in real time. That really accelerates the development process. And we want to make sure that that kind of workflow is possible in the web IDE. I think um, looking longer into the future, um, there's there's real opportunity to take the web IDE even further than where it is um, with more rich capabilities similar to a local development environment. Um, since we started working on the web IDE, tools like REPL, uh, uh, REPL at Eclipse Shea, um, Thea, there's a whole range of uh, tools that are quite mature and that they've evolved sort of at about the same time that GitLab has. Um, each with their own focus. And so I think particularly looking at some of those other open source projects, we might need to consider like, do we take some of those and switch out Monaco for a more feature complete um, open source library to build on? Um, or do we take our own path? Um, there's, there's a lot of questions, I guess, around um, how robust and how much of a replacement we want this to be for local development. Do we want the web IDE to become um, sufficient that a large, very conservative organization can say, no one's ever allowed to check out code again. You all have to use the web IDE. That's a very specific workflow for a very specific kind of customer that we need to consider for the future. Um, and we haven't really decided if that's the case or there's the other, the other kinds of workflows where it would also need to be pretty robust and much more feature complete than it is today. Um, say working on mainframe code. Um, there's very few people that are going to want to set up that development environment locally for very specific environments um, or occasional contributors to project. Uh, companies that practice inner sourcing where they want everyone in the organization to be able to contribute to their different libraries and tools that they're building internally. Uh, it's important that people can contribute with low barriers to entry, having to install all these dev dependencies locally just to add a couple of lines of code is a big barrier. The web IDE solves that. Um, to an extent today, it'll be better in a few releases, but to really get to where we're imagining is, is a little bit more work. Um, and so um, we'll probably need to be pushing towards that and then work out what the view is beyond there. I think, I think that's a really interesting use case. And when you think about commodity hardware being introduced in a lot of organizations. A lot of organizations are moving to Chromebooks yeah. um, and things like this where 
you know, e even for like Windows organizations, um, you know, obviously they're embracing the terminal a bit more than they were mm -hmm. just a, a year ago or even six months ago. Um, but those laptops, PCs, desktops are, you know, about a third of the cost of, of an entire organization grabbing a MacBook. So I think like there's actually this, this interesting shift in a lot of organizations that are moving to commoditized hardware. Mm -hmm. The web IDE is a way to standardize all of that and say, I don't care what you, what you get, as long as it's performant enough to like, you know, has enough memory to run Chrome or Firefox or whatever, you could get into the situation where the web IDE makes a lot of sense to standardize for a dev team. Now, yeah. I think in the current situation, uh, and the current you know experience from the web IDE it is one of my favorite features in the in the application. But I think if, as a developer, I would be pretty unhappy if I, if I was forced to essentially use it for all aspects of my day. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's it's a hard problem to solve. I, as a uh, a heavy Vim user myself, uh, in the background of this screen share is a giant terminal. You can't see it on your screen, <laughs> but like I take all my notes in Vim because that's the editor I like. Um, so it's, they're very personal. And also I guess this whole industry is a graveyard of failed companies. There are a lot of companies that have tried to do this in the past. Um, it's very difficult to build a high quality editor that works well in the browser. Um, the browser is really not designed for this kind of application. Um, so it's, it's quite difficult to do it well. Um, and then there's, there's all the, the server side problems of actually providing quickly, reliably, um, a good development environment that has all the tools correctly configured. Um, when developers run into a problem on their local machine, many of them are well equipped to fix it and resolve it or have a colleague that can help them. Um, if something goes wrong in a cloud-based environment, um, all of a sudden you're sort of, you're pretty stuck um, and only the system administrators can probably resolve that. Um, so there's, there's different risks and challenges associated with it, but it's, it's no doubt something that there's, there is an ongoing interest from certain kinds of organizations in there wouldn't have been so many companies started in the past trying to solve this problem. And there wouldn't be such ongoing sort of feedback about this kind of feature if it wasn't um, important. Um, dropping down into snippets. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, we've, we've got a pretty minimal approach to snippets um, at the moment. And I think the, there's, there's an obvious path to take in terms of adding version control and multiple file support by making them repositories. <laughs> um, so I, I'm pretty sure that's, that's the next step that we'll take. Um, in terms of making them more useful. But I think the, beyond that, um, I think we could do something a lot more interesting than just leaving them as a dumping ground for like random files and code fragments. Um, GitLab's got a lot of interesting components built right into it um, with the web IDE, um, CI runners, um, and thinking about some of the capabilities of the web IDE, what if we could use snippets as a way of bringing like interactive functional code snippets into discussions like um, in a merge request. So being able to run a function in some container and actually test it um, and building those kind of deeper integrations. Maybe, maybe we don't need snippets to do that, but certainly snippets are a place where code fragments are stored. And if they're a, an executable unit where we can do interesting things with, maybe there's um, some interesting applications for integrating them into other parts of GitLab, um, imagining issues where you could have a code pen style situation attached to it, where rather than linking to a code pen, you just link to a snippet and you have an embedded, embedded working version of your React or Vue.js component. Um, and you can experiment with it and it's linked to your component library. So in GitLab's case, it's linked to pajamas and it's pulling in that and you're interacting with it and then everyone can sort of see what the mock-up looks like and then it's just someone's job to implement it and write the tests. Um, those kind of things that'd be really interesting, um, and much more useful than just a flat text area. That said, it would be super awesome if I could just push and pull <laughs> to a snippet. <laughs> so I look forward to that. <laughs> You're on mute. I think. Yep. I was going to say, I would, if I could just do that, I, I would probably use it from a from a day-to-day -day perspective as of right now i i rarely interact with snippets 
Yeah. Yeah, there's been um, some interest, interesting tools built by other people in the past um, for other Git-based snippets um, for like hosting all sorts of interesting things, using them for unusual purposes. Um, it'd be great to see that kind of innovation and like connectivity to GitLab snippets as well. Um, so I mentioned search um, in quite a bit of detail, so I, I don't want to go into it too much more. Um, in the short term, we're working on Elasticsearch for GitLab.com. That's a really big project. Um, <laughs> The ETA for 11.11 .11 is for the MVC, which was getting it working inside of one group on gitlab.com. Um, this vision needs to be updated to reflect that there is a long pathway to getting this enabled for every single project on gitlab.com. Um, so we're working on that with um, a high degree of focus. And uh, that's, that's probably like the main focus for the next uh, six months or so. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a huge technical challenge. Um, working out how we split the elastic search index down. Do we have one elastic search server per group that works well for large groups, but then there's also lots and lots of small groups with only like one tiny project in them. So we need some way of sharding and balancing projects between different elastic search nodes, similar to how we have this for Giddily. So Giddily can shard data across many nodes to balance the CPU and storage requirements. Um, elastic search has similar requirements. Um, so, building all the management tooling around that, testing it, hardening it, getting it to production quality um, is, is non-trivial. Um, so we'll be working on that for a while to come. Um, but making search work well is critical. Um, live coding, not much to update you there. It's coming. <laughs> um, there's, we have interesting ideas well, there, there are some interesting um, epics that um, we've created one idea for sort of starting on it rather than doing simultaneous live editing is maybe broadcasting. So broadcasting the edits from one place to another so you can observe someone else's terminal uh, web IDE session. Um, that, that might be one way of uh, getting started without having to build all of the things in the first iteration. Um, but there's probably other ways of approaching this. Um, one of the particular challenges I've discussed at some length with Dower, one of our um, engineering managers in the create team, he, uh, he's been working on a new markdown editor with like WYSIWYG markdown editing capabilities for issues and merge requests. And one of the challenges we've discussed specifically is whether you're live editing plain text in the case of the web ID, you would be live editing plain text. But if we wanted the same engine behind live editing, markdown, rich text fields, um, if they're WYSIWYG, then you may not use the same data transfer structure behind the scenes um, because you're probably not going to be converting rendered HTML back to markdown then transmitting the markdown and re-rendering it. And that kind of loop would be error prone. So most of the, the live editing markdown interfaces or rich markup actually transmit some intermediate representation, which is more closely representative of the formatted output. Um, so there's probably a lot of investigation to work out how to build something that isn't single purpose. Um, I think that will make building an MVC hard if we have a, a vision to solve both problems simultaneously. Um, there's, there's probably a couple of video recordings and in uh, discussing the, the technicalities of this problem that I'm not equipped to discuss, but um, there's a lot of exploration to be done here. Um, yes, Gitter, um, briefly threaded conversations, community rooms, I mentioned those before. Um, yeah, it's the team has been quite small. Um, it's starting to grow. Um, and so we'll be starting to build out the roadmap to um, factor in the the growing team and uh, yeah, really bring more of GitLab into Gitter so that um, teams that use both um, have a really wonderful experience out of the box really easily. Um, and uh, the, the other big feature that's uh, sort of further down the pipeline is emoji reaction. So just bring that fun into, uh, into Gitter because it is such a well-loved feature in so many other chat tools. Um, that's a good one, yep. And I'll try not to dwell too long on Giddily. Um, not because I don't want to, but because I would too easily spend a lot of time discussing it. Um, 
one of the, the most important and biggest pieces of work that Giddily is working on at the moment is high availability. Um, high availability of Git repositories is really difficult. Um, at the moment, most of our customers are using NFS to provide redundancy and availability um, of the, the storage layer, but that, is problematic for a performance perspective because NFS adds a lot of latency to the IO operations and Git expects much, like very fast IO. Um, it's designed to be run on local storage, um, either a spinning disk or an SSD. And the difference between running Git on an SSD versus a spinning disk is very noticeable. You get much better performance. So adding a hundred milliseconds onto that by making network calls to a, uh, a network file system uh, is very detrimental to Giddily performance. Um, not shown here is work that we've done over the last few months to mitigate some of those problems for NFS users, but the ultimate solution is to provide them with an HA architecture that does not involve NFS. Um, so we're currently working on um, the beta of naive replication. So we're hoping for um, eventual consistency with a relatively fast replication delay. So sub minute, hopefully tens of seconds, um, but we need to actually put that under production load and see how our approach performs. And then once we have that in place and working to a sufficient level of performance, um, we'll then move towards automatic failover, um, which is probably the next hardest problem. And detecting when um, a repository is unreachable and um, coordinating the failover from one Giddily node to another. Um, and failover can be done on a, an entire server level or on a repository level. So if a repository for some reason becomes corrupt um, and unresponsive and um, we can fail over just that repository. And so that's one way we're going to be able to test this in production without having to shut down whole shards uh, in a production environment. We'll be able to simulate failures and see how it responds. Um, in realistic environments. From there, we've got like monitoring tools, uh, administration, all sorts of other things. And so we're hoping for the end of the year for that. Um, in parallel to that, we are working on um, native large file support and support for very large repositories. Um, and we're doing work in the Git project itself to enable those um, capabilities. So um, just last week, there was a change merge to fix a security issue um, for um, filtered clones, which is the sort of one of the key components of partial clones, uh, which is the Git approach to native large files and native enormous repositories, because you filter or filter out the stuff that you don't want and you partially clone it. Um, so working on that on the Git front and then also working on the uh, performance implications of that on the Giddly server. So working out which things to send and which things not to send for very large repositories is a very CPU intensive process. So doing that on the fly doesn't really scale. So um, that's the challenge that we're looking at along with faster clone performance for all repositories. So that's sort of a secondary priority behind uh, HA. So big things coming in Giddily this year. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, that's fantastic. So yeah, and that's that, the end. That is the product vision for create. Um, I don't think I can say in a nutshell because that was 40 minutes or so. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say we far surpassed the nutshell, uh, you know, yeah. criteria, but um, no, that was, that was really helpful. Um, you know, thanks for walking through that and for that labor of love. Um, no worries. Yeah. It, it's, uh, it's exciting to, to see what create is going to do this year. I think there's, like the balance of taking a few things that we already do pretty well and then just making them ultra lovable um, mm. is, is really neat when contrasted with these things that literally don't exist or they exist as an idea and, and taking those and capturing um, a new market such as design management and some of the live coding um, stories as well. So um, yeah. really, really exciting stuff. Yeah, I think it's a really exciting challenge taking things that are so... Uh, well used and well understood like code review um, and finding the things that are really valuable to improve. Um, there's always going to be new features that are proposed, but understanding like when to iterate and refine versus taking that next big step to really make it that much better. Um, 
one one vision item I neglected to mention on source code management and code review because it sort of sits between the two is distributed merge requests. Um, it's sort of a little way out in our vision, and um, I'm a little worried that it might slip uh, out of the at the end of this year as we focus on some of these really important quality of life improvements for code review and source code management. But it's distributed merge requests, so being able to open a merge request from one GitLab server to another, or even eventually from GitLab to GitHub, because there are open source projects that live everywhere that are forks of each other, um, private servers that have forks of open source projects that are hosted on GitHub. And if a bug gets fixed locally in a company's private instance, they need a way to get it up. Um, and I think there's opportunities like that um, throughout GitLab where things that seem mature, well settled, well understood, we can begin taking those next steps to sort of really raise the bar so that, um, I don't know, like we're already lovable, but like what does it, what's the next version of lovable going to look like? And can we raise the bar so that everyone else has to lift the bar as well? Um, those are really exciting yeah. opportunities. Absolutely. Well, James, thanks so much for this. Um, it was Thank great to, to be a part of it and uh, excited to get this on the site so that people can have a voiceover of the vision. Yeah, you too. Have a good afternoon. Okay, bye.